Hello, CASW members and anyone who may be tuning in wherever you are, wherever you're at. We're so happy that you are joining us for another hour long webinar. I see some of you have found that chat function. I am so happy you have found that chat function. Please feel free to drop us a line. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We also have a poll um, so you can do that as well so that we have those numbers uh, and we know who is accessing the webinars and from where. Um, my name is Alexander Zanis. I'm the Social Policy and Communications Coordinator here at the CASW. As always, I'm so happy to see your virtual names popping up and that we get to spend another hour together today. Um, before I get into this amazing webcast and our incredible presenter, I wanna just cover a couple quick housekeeping notes. For starters, happy Pride Month. Uh, we are so excited to be celebrating Pride Month and hopefully you are also going to be celebrating Pride Month in your communities, nationally, provincially, um, with your agencies, or even just with your families. It's an excellent month to start highlighting uh, some incredible activists, artists, advocates, um, and whatnot. I also wanted to highlight that it is National Indigenous History Month. So hopefully you're also taking some time to explore some of the amazing Indigenous artists, filmmakers, uh, again, activists, uh, advocates, water protectors, all of those incredible individuals this month because there is so much content. And I hope that you're also enjoying that either locally or nationally. Um, Couple of quick housekeeping notes about the platform itself. Your certificate of attendance can be accessed at the bottom under the course completion tracker when you've reached the required viewing minutes for this presentation. It also gets emailed to you, so check your junk folder or you can log back on at any time and access the uh, webinar certificate that way. Um, also, our housekeeping and announcement button is a little bit hidden today because we have a beautiful photo of some mountains in the background, but you can find that that has just some additional information you may want to check out if you're having any issues with the platform. As well, your screen is completely customizable, so feel free to take a minute and make the slides bigger, make the video bigger, make the chat bigger, uh, whatever is best for your viewing needs. I also want to flag for you the handout section. The handout section is where you can find the slides, a copy of the slide deck. You can find Charlene's uh, website. There's also a fun activity we're going to do called a Jamboard. Now, I feel a little bit untech savvy that I don't know Jamboard, but I'm excited. So <laughs> Char's going to take us through it. Um, but that's also going to be accessed in the handout widget, or we'll send the link in the chat as well when we get to that point of the presentation. There's some fun polls for you. Overall, I think it's just a great hour we're going to get to spend together, and I'm so excited. Charlene Richards has done a couple webinars for us before. Uh, one or two of those is in the handout section as well. We're so happy to have you back, Charlene. Um, and I want to just pass it over to you because I think that's it for me. And let's just get into the bulk of the presentation. Thanks for being here. Yes, perfect. Thank you for uh, having me back here. Yeah, this is number four. Um, and I was just thinking this morning how I'm pretty sure it was either April or May of last year that I came in and did the um, personal and professional strategies to reduce psychological stress during the pandemic and thinking about the sort of difference between then and now and everything we were sort of gearing up for and trying to anticipate in terms of the length of the pandemic and the, the factors that would be coming up in social work and how to try and do trauma-informed social work during a pandemic. Um, I think none of us, none of us have lived through a pandemic before. We probably don't have mentors who have lived through a pandemic. We didn't have a sort of playbook or a training on what to do. So um, one of the last things I'll talk about today is, is forgiveness of self. If there are any things that we are maybe judging ourselves for criticizing ourselves for um that we've done over the past year and and just sort of remembering that it we we had no sort of plan for this if if there's another pandemic which hopefully there is not we will have a lot more information on on what we need to do for for ourselves and for the people that we help so it's great to be back i love seeing all of the places that people are coming from so let me just, there we go, put the poll up. If you are if you can also um, fill out the poll in terms of what section of from Canada you're from. Seeing a lot of people from, so the three cities that I've lived in where I'm seeing people are Calgary, Ottawa, and Manitoba, um, but seeing a lot of Saskatchewan as well. Um, definitely some nice East Coast representation there. 
And yeah, so we can see here where people are coming from. Oh, we've got some, some BC as well. Excellent. It's so nice to, to connect say, with you. I love how many people are tuning in from Calgary where you're located. Yeah. <laughs> Downtown. Yeah. <laughs> I was sort of, um, I was chuckling before about how in Calgary we're referring to this as a heat wave. And those of us who have lived in Ontario <laughs> think that this is a beautiful summer day that we're having. And if it were minus, you know, 35, or sorry, plus 35, plus 47, then we'd be labeling it as a heat wave. I also want to just say, right. if you're, if you click the other button, let us know in the chat where you are from the other place. Yep. Anyway, yep. I'll pass it back to you. All right. So thank you for that. Um, there's the the results. So we've got four people from other. There we go. Maybe you got to uh, tune in from out of country. So just a little bit of information about me. I am a social worker. I've been a social worker since um, I entered BSW 2003. Uh, primarily worked as a social worker doing clinical work with addictions and mental health. Uh, the last few years, I've also been teaching at the University of Calgary through the Faculty of Social Work. And since 2008, I've been doing training with um, organizations around compassion fatigue, burnout prevention, and um, ended up founding Caring Safely. I also do some private practice therapy, and I included my theoretical orientations or modalities in case you are interested. There we go. So I currently am a resident in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I want to acknowledge that I am a settler and a guest on Blackfoot and Treaty 7 territory, which is also home to Métis Nation Region 3. I put the map on there. Um, sorry, I was reading, reading a chat there. I put the map on um, mostly because Sometimes when I'm doing these, there are people from around the world, they don't actually know where Calgary is in terms of their geographical location. Uh, so learning objectives, we're gonna talk a little bit about the difference between chronic stress, moral injury and grief, and then really talk about strategies to address all three of them. They are different things, but the experiences and all of them overlap, can overlap. So we're gonna look at the polls here. I, moral distress being a term that I believe is newer to social work than grief or chronic stress. So I wanted to do a poll in particular around um, moral distress and how much you know about it. Um, is it talked about, that kind of thing. So the first question being, how much do you know about moral distress in social work? If you can take a couple or a minute or so to enter that, there you go. While we're waiting, maybe if you can still see the camera, I'll show you. I showed the I showed them my mug. This is my favorite purchase from 2000 and first from 2020. And Fauci, we trust. If anybody else has fun mugs, we like to hear about those as well. Uh, all right, so just move forward for the next or for the results. All right, so as a term in, in social work, the majority of people want to learn more. We, we will be doing that. Perfect. Oops. There we go. Where do you talk about moral distress? So if you do know about it, if you do understand it, you are talking about it, is it happening in the workplace with your peers, um, in professional development, or with your healthcare provider? The webinar will actually be on YouTube as well afterwards for anyone who has to leave early. All right. Ooh, we have somebody tuning in from Thailand. That is incredibly excited. And India, oh my, the others are fun. All right, we'll go to our results. Um, so workplace and peers, a little bit in professional development, a little bit with healthcare provider. Excellent. I like it that it's peers the most. I think with these types of topics, so originally, you know, burnout, compassion, fatigue, vicarious trauma, peers tend to talk about it first. And then the more conversation that happens, it gets brought into the workplace. And then ideally when it gets brought into the workplace, there are some trainings around it, or we start looking at some um, school and professional development holding it as well. 
It's a mug that says social worker, what's your superpower? Yeah. Um, and then the last question about moral distress is just whether your workplace acknowledges and provides support for moral distress. So maybe they acknowledge it, but don't pro provide supports, or maybe they acknowledge it and provide supports. Again, because it is a newer term than things like vicarious trauma and burnout and compassion fatigue, I'm not expecting as many organizations to really have that on their scope at this point. Some do. Um, some have been, some of the organizations that I've been doing trainings with over the last year are really interested in it. They, they understand the concept of the, they understand the impact of moral distress, but they weren't entirely clear about what sort of is a predictive factor and, and what is it, what are the effects of it? So um, those trainings have been great to do with organizations. All right, so over half, not really. Some acknowledge it. So a quarter acknowledge, don't provide supports. 19 acknowledge it and provide supports. That's fantastic. If you want to share what kind of supports they provide, um, would love to, to hear that in the chat box. All right, so chronic stress. I'm not going to go into chronic stress quite as much as the other two, but um, just recognizing that chronic stress has a physical and a physiological um, and psychological component. So a lot of the, our stresses are perceptions of things, primarily when we feel like we don't have control over something, those psychological parts of stress tend to um, perpetuate stress, increase stress, um, trigger the physiological stress response. If we feel like we don't have control of something or if we're stuck in something, and if we don't have the resources to meet the demands, that's another key part of um, some of the, the psychological stressors that we can experience. And just want to sort of briefly review the notion that if, if we are regularly having the psychological stress, those thoughts that um, we, we don't have control, we are at risk, we don't have enough resources to meet the demands. And if that triggers our, our stress response often, the sympathetic branch of our nervous system, if that happens too much, it can become what can be referred to as a dysregulated stress response or hypersensitive stress response. Basically, it means that our, our nervous system ends up out of balance and ends up in sort of the stress mode full time. It doesn't get back down to that balanced state. We don't get the, the homeostasis happening for that. And when the stress remains high for a long time, that's when the hormones that come with the stress response um, can really start to compromise us physiologically, our bodies, our organs, our system. So the immune system and can potentially be doing damage long term to multiple organs and tissues, including the brain. So in the brain, what tends to, to get impacted is the prefrontal cortex. So things like memory, concentration, problem solving, decision making. Has anybody had difficulty in the last year and a half with short term memory, with focusing, with making decisions or, or problem solving? Um, I, I've, I've chatted with people about and I was you know, every every month that we were longer into the pandemic with more of the restrictions and the additional stressors that were coming up, I would be talking about how I truly believe we are all working at a diminished capacity. Our cognitive capacity is not what it used to be. So we can't perform the way we used to be. And, you know, short term, memory, forgetting words, forgetting appointments, um, decision making and some of the easiest stuff around what's my name? <laughs> some of the easiest stuff around decision making, right? Like it, I could be trying to order something online. It's not even important. And there's just too many reviews to make a decision. I just can't do it. So that is, we should still all be there. All We should still be struggling with all of this. And the people that we're working with should be struggling with it. And anyone we come into contact with, right? I'm, I'm, we'll get things delivered and see that they're going to the wrong house on more than one occasion. If I have to drive somewhere, I drive, I almost want to wear a helmet when I'm driving because I know people are so disoriented right now. And I'm, I drive slow and incredibly defensive and see people sort of not paying attention while driving, not necessarily on a device, but just not, we're not as present. The chronic stress definitely impacting our immune systems. Um, and, this is in terms of mood what i think is important so we could be looking at chronic stress associated depression at at this point for for how long we've been in here which is when we're looking at some of that early phases of chronic stress so if 
I know some social workers may have had chronic stress prior to 2020, and this was just more piled on. Other people may not have had that, and this the, the chronic stress started coming since you know March of last year for us in North America. But the early phases of that chronic stress associated, associated depression is social withdrawal, decreased physical activity, fatigue, sleepy and drowsiness, um, mood and cognitive alteration. So again, the, the concentration, decision making and negativity bias. So the body's recognized when the stress response is regularly triggered and going, it thinks it, it, it has these demands it needs to meet and it doesn't have the resources. So it's trying to conserve, it's trying to help us conserve our energy so that we can meet those stressors. The thing is, if we do these things for too long, if we are with if decreased activity, if we're withdrawn from people, if we're um, if our cognitive alterations are happening for a long period of time, we can actually start to shift into depression. So we would then be looking at the difference between this is normal and natural with chronic stress to if even if we reduce your stress, there's a chance that depression is, is going to be there now. Um, so some places have provided supports around um, mindfulness online. Excellent. So just to get a sense of where this group is at, just curious. Um, in the past month, have you experienced social withdrawal, decreased physical activity, fatigue, the sleepier drowsiness? Um, if, you, if you want to, you don't have to in the chat box, but if you want, you can sort of type in the number of what you've experienced over the last month. I would say, personally, I can admit to all of them except number four. I don't, sleepy and drowsy is not a thing that I often get. All five, yeah. I mean, some of them are forced, right? The social withdrawal, the, the ability to do the physical activities. Yeah. And then the fatigue that can come with that. Just the notion of not going to our vehicles if we're, if we're working from home and not doing like walking around as much. I know I was just chatting with one friend who, this is not funny, but it was kind of funny, who, you know, it's six o'clock at night and he's like, so I've had 600 steps today. <laughs> like that is, that is not good for a human. All right, so we we know that it's pretty pretty common. I'm curious in the Jamboard. So I'm you have the link to the Jamboard. I'll also put it in the chat box as well. There you go. So if you click on the the link to the Jam um, box, oh, I see we've got some people logged in already. If you haven't used a Jamboard before, basically we all see the exact same thing. And I have three pages. You'll see up top, it says one of 13 and there's an arrow left to right. So if you click on the right arrow, you can go through the pages. And if you're willing to share what, what has been the most difficult part of being a social worker during the pandemic, and you'll have time to do this because I'm gonna leave it up while, while I continue talking, but I think one of the things that is helpful in these situations where we don't have a history or an experience to draw on is to hear what other people are dealing with and hear how other people are dealing with things because it gives us a little bit of normalization to recognize um, we're not alone. Other people are, are experiencing this. So I, I like having these types of things where our group of peers share share their experiences because it gives us Oh, Jamboard reported too many accessing not available. My goodness, that's never happened before. Um, all right, we will we'll leave it up there. There could be some coming and going with their post-its and then um, you might be able to get on a little bit later. All right. So in terms of chronic stress, I didn't want to go into like your typical things for chronic stress because absolutely, you know, self-care, nourishment, um, relaxation techniques, all of those things um, are really important. And so the more the more ways that you can put your body into a state of relaxation, the more things you're doing that you enjoy, that's going to help. Um, that's going to help with the chronic stress. I wanted to come to it from a brain approach. So we know that the brain and brain cells are one of the are parts of us that are impacted with the chronic stress response. And there's been research that shows that there are certain things that can help in terms of actual brain health. So 
Um, I won't get into it too, too much, but when we're looking at some of our brain chemistry, there are these things called telomeres. I don't know if anybody's familiar with telomeres. They sort of um, are the sort of the protection at the end of our different cells. And when, when we're stressed or when we age, the protection starts to weaken, it starts to disintegrate, and then those cells can even die off. And that's what can happen with chronic stress. There are some things that we can do that can actually strengthen those telomeres and help them regrow, which I think is phenomenal when it comes to flashbacks to biology class. Yeah, I'm not going into, into the, that full, full um, course on that. There are some things that we can do though that can actually mitigate the impact of that, that chronic stress, which it also mitigates the impact of toxic stress in childhood, which to me is just amazing because sometimes we work with people who have experienced, often we work with people who have experienced complex trauma. We know that it's impacted the brain and there are things that we can do to start growing back some of that protection in those cells. So SEEDS is the acronym, social support, we, we know that. But I think what is really interesting is that not just connecting with people leads to empathy, but it's when we connect with people who, where we feel like we're getting approval and understanding. So I want you to think about who you spend time with that makes you feel understood and validated, because that's very different from just who you spend time with. And it can be, a good question, I mean, it's, it's good for us, it's good for the people we work with, but it can be a good question to ask ourselves when we're trying to intentionally do things to nourish ourselves, to not just, um, to not just spend time with anyone, but to particularly look for and evaluate how do we feel when we're spending time with certain people? Who makes me feel understood and validated? I can see some people moving into page two and three, that's great. Um, so that's social support. So, so I invite you to, to sort of, and it's the same thing with your peers, right? So when you're connecting with your peers, there's a difference when you're connecting with people who make you feel understood and validated versus there, there were certainly people who during this last year, year and a half, um, were really impacted and, you know, often felt like they were going to be leaving the field who were, um, maybe had a little bit of toxicity. There were some people who would be um, calling people or saying that people are having toxic positivity if they were focusing on the present, focusing on what they were grateful for. So again, just being, um, being mindful of who you spend time with. So evolution, physical activity, right? So much research has gone into the things that physical activity can do for the brain. Um, so serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, the, the, oh, somebody sent a virtual hug on the board. I love that. The Jamboard, I can actually download that into a PDA after. So I'm not sure if um, there's the ability to add that to, to somewhere as a link, but that document will come up. Charlene, I was also thinking maybe we could do a quick screen share at the end where we just showed everyone on if, in case they couldn't get it, what, what was put up there. So we can also do that at the end yep. of the Q&A. And the link will stay live, right? I'll, I'll leave the link live for a week or so, as long as it doesn't get bombed by someone inappropriate. <laughs> um, and then people can go on and keep reading through it, right? Because it's sort of that living document. Perfect. Yeah, so some people are logging off, so other people are able to log in there, perfect. Um, so physical activity. So one of the things I think is helpful to know because sometimes we are exhausted and don't really you know, have the energy for, for exercise. But I thought it was uh, interesting on a study that was done that showed 20 to 30 minutes of fast walking. So to have sort of a moderate heart rate for your age actually showed a cellular response that may help suppress inflammation in the body. So stress causing the inflammation, 20 to 30 minutes of the fast walking um, or getting your heart rate up to that moderate level can help help reduce that. Uh, education, so learning, um, using the brain in new ways, doing cognitive exercise can help reduce rumination, but maybe it's learning a new language, a new instrument. Jigsaw puzzles is, is a favorite of mine for sort of using the mind and, and focusing and concentrating. Diet, diet can impact our brain chemistry as well, and particularly the sort of the, the telomeres. And there are certain sh foods shown to increase the length of telomeres. So those who are eating legumes, nuts, seaweed, fruits, 100% fruit juice, dairy products, coffee. So again, people have their own health 
um, conditions for and need certain foods. But these ones were part of a study that showed um, that they help increase telomeres. And then usually most people I work with are incredibly excited that coffee is included in there. Um, and then foods that have been shown to reduce the length include alcohol, red meat, or processed meat. So I should mention the references are, are included on here. They're all at the end of the of the slides. And then sleep. We do need sleep. If our sleep is being impacted, looking at are medications that we taking impacting our sleep? Are there medications we should be taking if we're not sleeping at all? Are supplements impacting our sleep? I once took um, echinacea in the evening because I, I was feeling sick and I hadn't realized that echinacea can sort of bump up the blood pressure a little bit, but bumped up blood pressure can also physiologically feel like anxiety. And so this one evening I thought, why am I feeling like physiological anxiety? I'm not really worried about anything and I don't have blood pressure issues. And then I, I thought about it and was chatting with someone and realized, okay, echinacea is not a nighttime supplement for me. Um, and then watching, you know, our, our caffeine and alcohol impact, which can maybe make us feel a little sleepy and tired, but actually impacts our ability to get into some of those um, healthy sleep cycles. All right, disengagement. So in particularly over the last year, I think in order to get the, the nervous system into a calm state, we need to disengage in some way, particularly if we're working from home where we don't have that boundary between work and home anymore, or if we've started taking more, home, more, more work home. We, we are around pain and suffering regularly in, in the work that we do. And then over this past year and a half with the pandemic and the way that it has highlighted all of the, the inequalities, all of the historical social justices, current social justice justices, systems of oppression that have come up, it, you know, there's been a huge shift to, to address these, which is, is fantastic. It, it's amazing that, that this is happening. It's also brought up a lot more awareness for people and discussions around um, traumas and pain that people have experienced. And so while we do need to be aware of it and need to be involved in the, ch in the change, we also need to be able to have pockets of time that we can completely disengage and detach from pain and suffering. So I've, I've referred to it before with people as going into your bubble for short periods of time and long periods of time, right? How much time per day can you just completely disengage? <clears throat> Excuse me. It might only be 15 minutes or an hour um, versus longer periods. You know, every few weeks, can you make sure you get a full weekend off or, or a long weekend where you, I call it sort of a, a tech free weekend. Um, I do a tech detox where I'm not attached to technology in any way because that's where we're usually hearing a lot of information that's outside of work. Um, and with that, just some things around work, <clears throat> excuse me, if you are setting those boundaries, maybe letting people know in your auto responder what your working hours are, when they can expect to get emails from you. Um, tell, letting people know when they can reach you, that you don't necessarily always have your phone with you or that you don't respond to text quickly. One of mine is that if anybody needs to get in touch with me urgently, they have to phone because I'll turn my texts off regularly. Um, so if the phone rings, I'm actually paying attention to it because there's a few key people who, who it will be. Um, and then avoiding fictional material that contains trauma or pain and suffering as well. The other thing to, to keep in mind is if, there, if you use your phone for a lot of things, can you go old school, so to speak? So some of them in the last year purchasing a normal alarm and a clock so I don't have to look at mine. Um, purchasing, you know, a calculator so that I don't have to, and a map, well, I don't have a map actually, I use what's in the vehicle. Um, things that are your go-to on your phone, if you know that they suck you into going online or, or connecting online, trying to be, or replacing those so that you don't have to, um, go into that and sort of get hooked into that. And then I did include induced relaxation response. So again, anything that you can do to put your body into the, um, the state of relaxation. This is where I'm just gonna note that if you didn't um, go to the personal and professional strategies to reduce psychological stress during a pandemic, you can check that out as well for st um, strategies for chronic stress. 
All right. So moral distress. Moral distress is when you know what the right thing to do is, but for some reason you can't do it. There's either constraints or restrictions or a lack of resources. You want to do something that is in accordance with your professional judgment, but maybe it goes against regulations. Um, an example of that could be, which I've gone against regulations where um, you know if somebody comes in and there's a certain amount of time they can access a food bank and maybe that amount of time hasn't passed my professional judgment is this person needs food um, you know if we don't let the person have food because it, it it goes against the regulations then we can experience the moral distress associated with that um, doing something that goes against your values or when there's a discrepancy between your beliefs and behaviors so moral distress first came up with war veterans and we know what war veterans or we have an idea of what war veterans have to do in their in their work and a lot of what they're doing for a lot of them went against their values they didn't it, it didn't feel good they didn't want to do what they they were forced to do it and so moral distress leading to moral injury is a term that was really started to be discussed with war veterans it shifted over into to nursing tended to be the um the next area that really started to, to study it and to me it was something that jumped on my radar a lot more last spring when the first wave of the pandemic came through and we were seeing nurses around the world and doctors around the world who didn't have the equipment to support people, right? They knew what they needed to do or what they believed was the right thing to do at the time, but they didn't have a ventilator, they didn't have a room, they didn't have a person to help them. So they were experiencing moral distress multiple times a day for, for weeks on end. In, in terms of social work, there, there have now been more studies that are being done with moral distress in social work. So it being defined as a work-related malaise that develops when a social worker cannot practice in a morally appropriate way because of internal, personal, or external obstacles. So when we think about the work that we're doing, even prior to the pandemic, so many of the people that we work with um, are oppressed, are, are marginalized, don't have the same access to resources, the system isn't funded, our, our public systems aren't funded enough to have those resources. So, so many times we know what we want to do with people and what would be the most helpful, but the resources aren't there. So I think moral distress is something that, you know, for me, as long as I've been in social work, I believe is there. It was just not a term that I was really looking at or, or for this reason. So we have initial moral distress and reactive. So initial is what the first time that we do something that goes against our values. And then reactive is the stress that, or the distress that follows after that initial distress, that lingering state that impairs us over a long period of time. So sometimes if we're unable to do the work that we want to, or we're required to take action that goes against moral or professional code. So I'm going to ask a question and you can put it in in the chat box with the pandemic. We know that that has radically changed our um, clients experiences, the way that we practice social work. Um, I'm just wondering what current workplace experiences could contribute to moral distress. And if you can include or if you can do that one in the chat box, we can see that. So some of the predictors of moral distress. Um, constant haste so if we don't have enough time to meet the needs of our clients or to meet the demands of the administrative work if we feel like we're constantly rushing from one sort of task to the next um insufficient resources not enough time not enough equipment not enough spaces to get into programs not enough employees to have um manageable caseloads the insufficient infrastructure that can mean a variety of things from maybe we don't have mental health crisis services in our community most of our communities don't have that um, inpatient psychiatric care for people addiction program spots so all of that can contribute as well the inability to implement skills and knowledge to our fullest extent and sometimes that could be our our program might only allow a certain number of sessions or we might only be able to meet with people a certain amount of times we know that if we had more time we might be able to do something different or, or deeper but we can't because of the the programming 
and which is often what the last one is those regulations or constraints resulting from prioritization of economic interests in Canada that's usually referring to to the funding for the public spots that are available so let's just see what some people have for what has been contributing to or what could be happening in the workplace so not allowing family to see their loved ones. Oh my goodness, yes, the personal care homes, the any and anybody in healthcare not being able to to connect with family because of the restrictions. Um, knowing that clients need human contact, but works done by phone and Zoom. Yeah, again, family members, clients needing resources that have closed down due to COVID. Yeah, just they just not available. The pandemic isolation and stress equal to what clients are experiencing. Yeah, we are experiencing these stressors at the same time as other people. Wait lists, management's expectations of performance, management. Yeah, it um, that has, has yeah, <laughs> it's, it's been very individual in terms of how different managers have approached this. Constant focus on protecting yourself and others from COVID, absolutely. Um, all right, tons here. I'll let you read through that. Worrying will spread COVID to go see clients, but also feeling bad if you do phone meetings. Yeah, so many things you know and wanted to do and couldn't do. So some of the effects of moral distress. Um, so for you, or you might want to think about how many of you have experienced the, or how many of these have you experienced in the past month? maybe an increase in frequency, intensity, or duration from decision-making, um, feeling guilt and shame. So this is, this is where moral distress differs from compassion fatigue. With moral distress, because of the nature of what it is, you almost always see the guilt and shame attached to it. Whereas with compassion fatigue, you don't necessarily have that guilt and shame in the same way or for the same reason and, and sort of at the same intensity. So for people who are wondering or trying to differentiate, excuse me, the, when the guilt and the shame is there and it's because you couldn't do what you wanted to do, it would fit with, with moral distress. So there might be a loss in trust in self and others, um, deity, negative self-talk, decrease in confidence and self-worth, our exhaustion, avoidance, substance abuse, isolation, impact our ability to care, and all of that can lead to social and relational problems. So for moral distress, the goal isn't to fix moral distress. It's to learn how to integrate those experiences into your life and into your work to try and mitigate the emotional and toll that it, toll that it can take. So if you can label it, that's usually a good place to start. So if if you're in a situation where you know there's something you want to do and you can't, and we just looked at a lot of different reasons why that can happen, recognizing, okay, well, I, it's normal and natural for me to be experiencing moral distress here because of the situation I'm in. Um, peers, strong protective factor. Again, just that note around who makes you feel understood and validate, validated. And then purpose and meaning making, I think, is a really powerful way to, to start looking at moral distress. So a, a practice that I like to do with people is to help them make a personal narrative um, about the situation that they're in, what they're working in, and how to bring some purpose and meaning to the role of a social worker. So you can start with a reflection. This is something that um, I would invite you to sort of sit down for about half an hour to reflect on some of this and maybe do that a couple of times and, and start working through to your personal narrative. But think about how a, your role as a social worker has changed your worldview, um, your view about the world and people in this world. Think about what does it mean be that your worldview has changed and how has it impacted the way you think your relationship to yourself and your relationship to others? Because we know that we're impacted in not so good ways sometimes, but we're also impacted in good ways through vicarious post-traumatic growth, vicarious um, resilience. And then think a little bit about how you've grown because of your work as a social worker and why is it important for you to integrate the work that you do, even though you do see pain, you, there is the pain that comes, comes with our roles at time and the growth that we see. How, why is it important to integrate that into your life in a way that you can stay healthy? And then think a little bit about the, um, 
formal role that your current role is as a social worker? What's the formal description of your role? What's the formal purpose of it? And you can personalize that a little bit by thinking about your beliefs that you hold, the beliefs that you hold as a provider, what life experiences you bring personally and professionally to your current role, any religious or um, spiritual beliefs, your education, training, professional principles. And then create your personal statement on how you explain your role with meaning and purpose. So I shared, I shared mine, an example of mine. So my statement is, I alone did not create the situation my client is struggling with. I alone will not solve it. I will do whatever I can within my limits to help this person. I will trust that the others responsible will also do what they can and will focus on my client's strengths. I will manage my emotional discomfort that comes up because this will allow me to continuously provide compassionate care personally and professionally. So that was pre-pandemic, having had this also being my very first pandemic and more of the moral distress coming up because of that, I adapted it. And so adapting it to recognize that our work might be different and our abilities might be different because of a crisis situation. So mine for the past 15 months has been both myself and the people I help are experiencing collective trauma and grief. This transitional period is causing more stress for everyone and we don't have the same access to resources. The reality is, is that all of us are vulnerable to death directly or indirectly. The information I have today may change tomorrow and I need to be transparent about this. I will approach each day with self-compassion for my abilities and compassion for my clients and others in the responsibility pie. So that's a, a tool that I use for sustainable caring. I will focus on the most important needs and advocate for my clients where I can within my limits. So I invite you to look at that as a fluid statement that those statements, they, you know, the, the, the first one that I showed you that, that, that evolved over a couple of years as I continued to, to do that practice and we'll shift into grief. So just recognizing, um, different forms and different layers of loss over this last year, right? Losses, whether it's from death and illness, loss of our traditional spaces, our sense of community, our sense of safety, our sense of trust in the healthcare system, maybe a loss of meaning and purpose in what we're doing. And then the layers that have come up, including that inability to grieve the way we would normally grieve or have certain customs or rituals or to connect and get support with people. We can't travel, can't hug or touch each other, um, have missed out on many um, milestones that we would normally celebrate and just not even able to spend time with the people who do make us feel good if they aren't within our bubble. Different forms of grief that we might be experiencing are personal grief, collective grief, <clears throat> disenfranchised grief. And then with a grief during a pandemic, we could be looking at it contributing to things like loss of motivation and concentration. Concentration, especially even pre-pandemic, if I'm ever working with someone who's just had a loss, I talk about the way concentration is impacted and how there's a need to be incredibly present or mindful when doing anything dangerous like driving or using, um, I was gonna say weapons, but I mean <laughs> like devices that could cause harm if you're, you know, um, chainsawing down trees or something, you want to be very careful when your concentration isn't there. Um, if you're cooking or running hot water or have fires on, setting timers so all of that gets checked. It can be hard to, to see clearly, to make decisions. There's often an emotional roller coaster. We might feel like we're failures, like we're not living up to standards. Um, and the thing about the grief in the last year that I think is a bit unique because it was collective, it was happening in so many different ways is that it made it a bit difficult to reflect on what was happening and how to integrate it into our life story. It wasn't a one-time crisis that, uh, you know, if systems theory say we should be able to rebalance. It was sort of crisis and new restriction and crisis over and over and over again. And so for a lot of us, even now, we still haven't necessarily had the time to um, reflect on what has happened and how are we you know if we're looking at narrative therapy or theory how do we integrate that that narrative into our life story so different strategies for for processing grief i think writing can be helpful i like writing with relaxation because it allows us to um to to write and process emotions without having the stress response activated and 
when we so so the practice is usually to to journal free journal for about two minutes and then pause and do something to trigger your relaxation response like deep breathing for two minutes and then to alternate going back and forth when when people do this especially with intense emotions i think it can be really helpful it's actually amazing in how short of a period we feel like we have sort of processed some of that physiological energy of emotions, some of the emotional um, parts of the emotions versus taking something and just free writing for, you know, maybe an hour, an hour and a half where we're just constantly writing and we're activated. Um, when we when we bring in that stress response, when we slow down the body, we we stay a bit more present. Our cognitive focus stays a little bit more on track and we, we process those emotions. Embracing the arts. So this here is, I, I think it, it was something for me for sure, but I was starting to read about, you know, what are other social workers doing to manage this as well. And there was this reflection of, because it's difficult to reflect on things during a crisis that sometimes the arts can be a better way to express things. And I am not an artsy person, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have artistic talents, but if we can consume if we can consume content that comes from imagination instead of data and facts which is what we often do in our work and often we're reading you know clinical books outside of work so for me it was getting back into fiction the last year um but there might also be if writing isn't good for us maybe we want to use photography it's difficult to read anything and maintain focus. Yeah, so writing and reading might not be good, but maybe music or photography or you know painting or drawing or poetry, those things might give you a different way to reflect on things, to express things. And even if it hasn't been something that you've ever done before, because again, this is a, an experience that you've never had before, getting to this many months into a pandemic as a social worker diamond painting and adult coloring books that's fantastic <clears throat> the diamond dot painting my mom does that she's made a few really nice ones hallmark movies yeah all depends so i went i learned about marvel at marvel studio last year i watched all of the marvel cinematic movies that came out because i really just needed you know fantasy and imagination started painting origami interesting Another one that that has has come up in terms of what some social workers have found help, helpful for for grief is advocacy. And this was the year where we knew as social workers about a lot of inequalities, a lot of systemic vi um, violence, systemic racism. Um, we saw a huge shift of of people wanting to advocate for those who have been oppressed, who have experienced trauma um, and there's there was a quote i shared with my caring safely group last may i think it was last june um so it's a maya angelou quote you should be angry you must not be bitter bitterness is like cancer it eats upon the host it doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure so use that anger you write it you paint it you dance it you march it you vote it you do everything about it you talk it never stop talking and for me, this was so powerful, especially last June when there were so many protests going on um, for recognizing the, the violence against black people through the police in, in the US. And of course, we, we talk about other violence and, and racial violence and oppression that happens in North America and around the world. Um, but when I read this, it really resonated with me because I actually felt like I was getting bitter. Like I was going beyond angry. I was getting into to bitter. And so I started to think about, you know, anger isn't always a terrible emotion. We can't always be angry and activated. That's not good for the nervous system, but we can bring in anger and use it to take action. So whether we're donating, whether we're organizing with our local politicians, um, whether we're doing digital advocacy online, Anti-Hate Canada is a fantastic organization. They're doing great things to stop a lot of the, the hate that is happening in Canada. Um, so especially during a time like what has happened over the last year and a half where we didn't have a we didn't have control we often were at home feeling helpless right maybe we didn't feel safe going out to marches but we can contribute and organize and donate and raise do consciousness raising really bringing in our feminist um 
per perspectives and theories into the work that we're doing and even into the work that we're doing with clients, right? To, to talk about that consciousness raising empowerment. Here's where you contact your MLA. Here's where you contact your, your MP. Here's an organization that, that's working on this. So I think to me, I think that's a really, it's a beautiful way to, to look at using some of the sadness and anger that can come from certain types of grief. So we're just going to wrap up again. So just, you know, we're looking at these three different things. They might be overlapping. We don't need to know which one for sure. We, if we identify with one more than the other, we can, can look at some of those strategies. You don't necessarily need to prioritize, but I do believe if your nervous system has been triggered regularly, like if the stress response has been triggered regularly, that getting your body into a state of relaxation as much as you can and trying to rebalance the nervous system is going to help you in everything else that you do. It's going to help all of your organs, help your brain do the things to manage moral distress, do the things to, to process and manage grief. It's of course your choice, which ones you, you use. I do think that that's um, an important one to bring on early on. If you know that you've had that, that stress response going off, um, regularly. And again, so forgiveness, I mentioned at the very be beginning, if yeah, meditation can also be fantastic for some people for that. Um, for again, forgiveness, if you've got any sort of harsh judgments or criticisms or, you know, regrets that you're holding on to about yourself or things that you've been done throughout this other as, as, as a role personally or professionally, um, just recognizing that we had no idea how to get through this last year and a half. We still don't entirely know. It's not 100% over. It's getting close to the end. But hoping that you can can look at and approach some forgiveness for self. And that we've got the resources and the end. So we'll shift over to questions. Amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, I think I had this up. So I'll bring that down. Uh, thank Perfect. you. Uh, I wanted to quickly flag for individuals, you know, if you if you came on late or if you had to leave early, like Charlene said, this is going to be on both YouTube and this dedicated webinar platform. On the platform itself, it'll be about an hour after we conclude the presentation, but you can log back in through the emails that you have and watch it again on this setup or when we put it on YouTube. Um, I think I wanted to also say that if you have questions, because this is going to be the Q&A section, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Just sometimes they get lost in the chat, so it's just easier if you put them in the Q&A for me. Um, before I go into questions, though, I did want to just do that quick screen share um, and show you all the Jamboard in case you had some issues accessing it. Uh, I hope this works. Let me know in the chat if this is working. Yep. Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, this I'm like, just as long as I know. <laughs> uh, and I love this, like the virtual hug for everyone. Yes. Um, I just love that. You guys really, it's so lovely. Um, and just some really amazing content here. Uh, so feel free to log back on anytime. I loved this too. Char, like what's been the most helpful for you and just seeing this. I know for a lot of people, a lot of pets, you know, time with my dogs, etc. Um, yeah. I really yeah. look forward to going through these. I haven't had a chance, but I'll definitely be going through all of these. I know. Okay. So um, now we can go into the question period. I'm going to stop my screen share there. I just wanted to make sure everyone had a chance to see that. Um, so one of the questions for sure is on how to mitigate actually the moral distress and moral injury that we're seeing in our communities as well. So are, do you have any kind of quick tips for individuals who are facing systemic barriers, um, they are facing systemic oppression, uh, and trying to insert these kind of tips and tricks when out in the field? So I might just need a bit more clarification. Is it so it's the when we're experiencing a social worker's moral distress because of what we're seeing out in the community? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think what this is where I really like the adaptation of the personal narrative from. So when I showed my personal narrative pre pandemic to post pandemic, and the realization that there is not the ability to do things the way we used to do because 
life and community is not the way that it used to be. So I think if if we're holding, and this kind of goes back to stress, if we're holding on to the perception that we should be able to do what we used to do when we're in a situation where we absolutely cannot do what we used to do because that's just not available, mm-hmm. I think that is going to increase the moral stress that we have versus acknowledging that it's not an option anymore. And we can feel sad about it. We can feel angry about it. We can, you know, advocate for that, um, advocate for people. But I think that perception and judgment for people, and and this is a really good question because so many people that I I work with, and often it's through private practice therapy, um, feel like they should right now still be able to function the way they did in December, 2019. Right. And you can't possibly function like you did then after everything you've experienced and the way things are. And if we hold on to that judgment and belief that we should somehow be able to do things that other people can't or that just aren't really possible, I think that's going to increase. So a lot of it is that sort of perception and acknowledgement of the current situation. It doesn't mean we have to like it or agree with it, but that can mitigate what it is that we're experiencing in those moments. Mm. Yeah, that is such a such a good point. Um, Deborah asks, "What happens when you reach apathy?" Yeah, so this is when we're sort of looking at: Have we gotten to the point of burnout? Morally and ethically, should we still be practicing? We should be checking in with clinical supervisors. If the thing with apathy is that we are no longer accessing empathy and compassion and empathy and compassion guides so much of what we do and it helps us do really safe work if we can empathize with people and if we can't do that anymore we're at risk of missing things that could be very important or we're at risk of doing harm to people particularly if we take a trauma-informed perspective we might have no intention to do harm we might just be completely burnt out because of what we're experiencing. The person that we're connecting with doesn't know, doesn't think, I mean, we know what's going on is all about us, but it's entirely possible that they think it's about them. And so now their experience with us, with the system of us is, is being impacted. So there does come a time where we may need to leave. We may need support from clinical supervision. We may need a reduction in hours to get back to, to that point. Cause at apathy to me, we're getting to that burnout level. Mm-hmm. I hate to give us a plug, but we did. Oh, I think I hurt myself twice. I hurt myself twice. Hurt. Are you hearing, are you hearing me twice hearing or is it just me? No, me? just once. Oh, okay. you must Great. have a different speaker <laughs> on. Um, so anyways, um, we actually also just did a national ethics webinar. Um, so the ethics of burnout. Um, Ooh. so if you are thinking about wondering what, what are the ethics of when you're starting to feel burnt out, you can tune into that. We did it last week. It is on our YouTube and on the CSW webinar library as well. And we partnered with the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers to do that. So you may want to check that out if you are feeling like you're getting to the point where you're wondering if it's ethical to continue to be practicing. Um, and there's also a ton of other resources that aren't CISW. I'm sure that they'll be, uh, you can you can find them if you Google it or even uh, included in our webinar, we do have the same kind of idea of handouts and resources. So you may want to just check that out if you don't want to watch the full uh, offering. Um, we are getting up to kind of towards the end of our time. We do have a lot of questions, so apologies for anyone if we didn't get to your question. Um, there is a really good one here, and it's how do you prepare people for the moral distress that is just inevitable in our field? So as a university instructor with BSW and MSW students, I'm talking about it in class, right? If ideally we, we start to talk about this more as early as we can in social work, just like it was with compassion fatigue, the recognition that in our societies, at least in North America, there still is a lot of oppression of people for class, race, um, sexuality, gender, that quite likely the work we're doing is going to happen with people who um, have been oppressed, are oppressed, don't have the same access to resources. So again sort of that preparation and mindset of going into it knowing that this is is what is happening that we're not going into a situation where everything's going to be great you know if we think of of firefighters you know they don't go into every situation thinking everything's going to be good they go into the situation knowing that something terrible could happen right so when you are sort of mentally prepared to go into it 
it gives you a bit of um, a bit of resilience going into it. And then if you're regularly labeling and discussing it and talking about it and connecting with your peers, because connecting with peers is one of the strongest protective factors, then we can start to mitigate it differently than not talking about it, feeling the guilt and shame, letting it build up, thinking it's all just us until we get to, to burnout. So, you know, sharing the message, you all sharing the message as much as you can. And just like compassion fatigue and burnout started to come more and more into our discussions, I think moral distress will as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the more we talk about it, the more we have conversations about it, of course, the more awareness and resources we access. I wanted to also flag that within your resource section, we also have the social work peer to peer support group on Facebook. Um, so that's a great place where you can talk openly and honestly with social workers across the country about what you're experiencing or, you know, seek any kind of resources or tips if you're looking for a platform for private practice, um, anything like that. So feel free to, to check that out since I did see a lot of people saying that they appreciated peer support. Um, I see so many things in both the chat and the q and I'm so sorry we don't have more time to get to them. Uh, but Melanie has this kind of, I think, a, a good almost wrap up question. And, and that is, what is the number one takeaway you want us to have from today? And I think that's lovely. Yeah, I, I think it's the number one takeaway is, I won't say forgive yourself because I know forgive yourself is difficult for people, but acknowledge what you have gone through in the last year right? Like acknowledge that what you went through is not easy. It's incredibly difficult. There's been grief, there's been trauma and yet you're still here and there's going to be a path forward. And I, I think that our, our recovery from the pandemic is going to be months and years ongoing because this was a collective trauma, collective grief for a lot of us. So my number one takeaway is to just acknowledge how I don't want to say strong or resilient, but just acknowledge that you as a human who cares about people is still here today in this role in, in spite of everything that you've experienced in the last year and a half. Yeah, we are so, like at the CSW, we're just so proud of social workers across Canada who have adapted so quickly and managed both their personal and professional uh, adaptations to a changing world. And, um, you know, I don't know if anyone on here read any of our stuff from National Social Work Month, but we just couldn't be more prouder of the social work profession in Canada and what you guys have stepped up to do. Um, it's been truly remarkable. And so give yourself that. I mean, not my number one takeaway is to put my mom on Do Not Disturb, I think. <laughs> But uh, I don't think you explicitly <laughs> said that. <laughs> but I feel like that's what I, I got. It was an from. underlying message. Yeah, that's what I think it might be mine. All about um, perception and interpretation. <laughs> that and to put more timers on when I'm cooking because my poor fire alarm. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll leave it on that note just so everyone has a little insight into <laughs> my life. Thank you so much, Charlene. I'm going to give you kind of the final words here, but we're just so, thank you so much. Every webinar we do with you is just always so great. And I, I just appreciate the time and energy you take out of your busy teaching and a business schedule to come spend time with us and, you know, the effort you put in behind the scenes as well. It's just really remarkable. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you all for your participation in the chats and the jam boards and for registering and spreading this information, which I know you will. Yes, please share widely, share widely with your colleagues, with your peers. Um, for any of the students online, feel free to share with your practicums and whatnot. I think it's a great activity um, for all of us to take. And, and on that note, we'll see you in a couple weeks for our final webinar before the summer. Uh, so hopefully you can register for that. Uh, and yeah, just have a great rest of your day and hopefully you take some time to unplug either tonight or tomorrow or the weekend. Okay. Bye, everyone.